Um, great. Well, welcome everybody to today's program. Uh, bear with me for a moment while I pull up my screen here. Okay, so welcome to today's program. Uh, my name is Alec Cooley. I'm a senior advisor here with Bush Systems and um, I'll be the host for today's program. Um, our title today is um, uh, Ask an Expert About Waste Reduction in Healthcare. And, and we're gonna be joined in a moment by Erica Kimball of Kimball Sustainable Healthcare, um, who's gonna be our, our expert for today for today's program. Um, as, as the name implies, we're, we're focused again on healthcare. Um, some of you may have joined us last month when we had um, our January webinar was focused with case study presentations on uh, different, you know, the, the different complexities of, of waste from healthcare and, and how we address those um, uh, through a circular economy model. Today's program, as, as we've advertised, is, um, is different. This is going to be a less structured, uh, no formal presentation. This is meant to be more just a uh, back and forth, sort of in the spirit of um, a professor's office hour. So um, there, we are going to have some structured questions that we're going to go through and some that have been submitted in advance. Um, but we also invite you during the program, if, if you have a question or if you want to riff off a point that's been made, um, you can both participate um, by just um, just join us. You can turn on your camera and your audio and be able to just jump in. Um, if it gets it's a little backed up, we may ask folks to use the, the raise hand uh, function, but for the moment, we'll just assume we'll start um, casual. Um, I will point out that we are recording this, so if you do not want to have your your, your be, be shown on a recording uh, that will be posted online, um, then you'll probably want to keep your camera off and just use the chat function, um, or regardless, you can use that if you want to submit questions. Also, feel free to use the chat if uh, if you have your own solutions, you know, um, ideas to riff off of things that have been raised by, by others or that Erica has made. Um, again, this is meant to be a back and forth and sort of tap our collective uh, knowledge that's out there. So I encourage folks to engage uh, through that. I'll also point out that as we go through the, through the, the discussion, um, Erica's, for a number of the points that she's going to be referring to, she's uh, passed on some different resources. So um, look for those. We'll be dropping the links for some of these resources into the chat, and then we'll also have them posted um, after the program. We'll, we'll be putting, a, as I said, a, a recording of this discussion will be posted online, and we'll send out a notice to folks afterward, and those resources will also be available through that. Um, so I think, I think we're good. I'm just seeing if there are any other notes I want to cover up front. Um, let's just jump right into it. Um, so, um, I'll point out, well, I guess what, one thing, last thing I'll, I'll mention before I introduce, uh, Erica, again, we're, we're keeping this as a loose, uh, format. Um, we are kind of, we were thinking sort of group these into a couple different themes. So we'll start off, we have a number of questions about recyclability and how do you evaluate that opportunity for whether whether to, to collect things for recycling. Uh, we'll probably start out using that as a main focus. And then, um, and then as we move through the hour, um, also shift over and talk about something uh, using the, the waste reduction hierarchy, the reduce, reuse, recycle, and how to use that um, that hierarchy to guide decisions on what is the best option. Is it recycling? Is it reuse, et cetera? Um, and, then, and then also talking about how do we even move forward and what are some of the steps and processes for implementing solutions? So, um, so with that, let's go ahead and let me just introduce Erica. Um, if, uh, again, if you joined us last month, uh, you, you saw Erica's full presentation, um, but um, Erica is a healthcare sustainability leader with more than 15 years in the field. She is the founder and CEO of Kimball Sustainable Healthcare, a consulting firm that develops sustainability strategies, programs, and communications for hospitals and healthcare. Erica began her sustainability journey as a staff nurse leading volunteer waste reduction projects in clinical units. So she brings firsthand knowledge of, of the complexities and uh, from the healthcare side. Um, she now works with uh, with uh, different stakeholders and clients to create solutions that improve environmental outcomes while supporting hospital quality, safety, and value. She is a certified true zero waste advisor and knows that healthcare waste is a solvable problem. Erica holds an MBA with uh, from uh, Presidio Graduate School and a BSN from the University of South Florida College of Nursing. 
So with that, I'm going to turn off my screen and um, and let me hand it over to Erica. Um, I don't know if there's some sort of opening words you want to say before we jump in, but. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much, everyone, for spending your uh, Wednesday morning or afternoon, depending on what side of the country you're on with us. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure. Um, thanks to the folks at Bush Systems for hosting this. Again, uh, we at KSH are a huge fan of this webinar series, and so it's really fun to get to do two of them this year. Um, I think just kind of a couple, we got a bunch of questions beforehand, and so I think a few themes that we'll touch on um, one thing is really um, zero waste is a team sport. And so it really is a relationship business, no matter if you're in a hospital at a, maybe city government or you're a hauler, uh, really, uh, you know, sharing, shared, you know, establishing shared knowledge base and transparency is really important. Um, and then I look forward to kind of digging into some of these questions, just talking about the technical aspects of what you can do with healthcare materials, but really how we apply zero waste best practices to continue to move upstream and prevent waste. So I think we'll kind of start there and then I think jump in. Okay, great. Um, so let's start off with some of the questions that were submitted um, with the registration form up front, um, just about recyclability. Um, and the first one I'll, I'll, I'll throw out, um, I don't know if Crystal from uh, Johnson Community College is on the line, but if you are and you want to, um, uh, just turn off, turn on your camera and speak up. Feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I can just uh, verbalize the question that you submitted in it beforehand. I'll give it a second to see if uh, we're hearing from it, Crystal. Okay. Then, um, then we'll come back to this. Well, we'll come back. We'll see if she's joining us. Um, we also had a, a question from M with UCSF. Um, Emma or Emily, are you on the line? Would you like to jump in? Okay. If not, then um, then um, I'll, I'll just start off with one of the questions. Um, um, Emily, again, with the University of California, San Francisco, had um, she, she put in just in general that they have several brick items about their healthcare system. Um, they're working to dispose of responsibly. Uh, curious for some insights on that. Um, gee, let me. Hi, I'm actually here. I'm sorry. Oh, you are. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, so we have several um, what we call tricky items that we are trying to work on um, recycling or using. Um, one specific item of high interest are gel ice packs that we get from pharmaceutical companies um, in <clears throat> in our shipments, both to and from patients. Um, and we've been looking to a lot of vendors uh, to see who would be interested in taking them for reuse or recycling, and we're having not a lot of luck. So I was wondering if you had any insight or any advice um, or knew of anybody in the Bay Area that might be interested. Yes, thank you. Uh, I am working, um, advising on a gel pack recycling opportunity project as well. This comes up a few every few years. In healthcare, one thing that is common is we have to ship and receive cold things. And so we get these cold shipping packages. If you've ever been a member of a grocery uh, meal prep plan, you have gotten these at your front doorstep, but we get them by the hundreds in the healthcare setting. And so uh, we have a net, we're a net producer of ice pack waste. They're really heavy. Um, and so Part of uh, this is um, safety. It's also, you know, they get goopy if they uh, thaw. So there's some processing considerations. But uh, a couple things. One is there's a few vendors that are popping up that are look, taking a second look at ice pack uh, re reprocessing. One, I think that is evaluating this as dispatch goods. And they have a outpost on the East Coast, they have one on the West Coast. And so uh, they're one vendor that's taking a look at this. Uh, I think just any of these tricky to recycle items inside of the healthcare industry, sometimes solutions, well, I think the first step is you really wanna evaluate the impact because whatever the solution is, you need to make a business case for it, an environmental case. So really getting some good data as a basis 
How many do we generate a year? Also, where are they coming from? That's the basis of your process plan. One thing I'm thinking about a lot with ice packs is how do, how do we, the hospital, I, I have a grocery service and I'm able to send back my ice packs and if they melt, it gets a little, you know, I'm like we can, we can gel and that's not great for my home. It's definitely not great at scale for a hospital. So really thinking about how we keep them frozen until they get collected. Um, so there's some pull frequency considerations and things of that nature. A anyway, so kind of the basis is get your total count, really map out where these things are going in the hospital, figure out where you can keep them frozen is my advice. And then uh, again, the one vendor that I know is looking at this is Dispatch Goods. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, I guess, from my own side, Erica, it's a question. Um, you know, I, I, I used to work on the university for a university, and we had a whole system set up trying to collect, you know, reusable items that were being um, otherwise discarded. I mean, Devil's Advocate is is a, a reuse um, or ice packs like that. Are that something that are reasonably could be collected and having some system to donate them to local? I don't know. Um, is, is there sort of aftermarkets that if there's a system in place that's set up to collect those? Yes. And the one thing that I do like about the dispatch goods model is it's a wash and redistribute. I assume there's a cost involved and that's why you really want the total count. There have been pro products on market that offer a reusable gel pack that's a little more rigid plastic. They're out there. Something that gets tricky always is the economics of these things we should always be aiming for a reusable, durable model. And so even if they want, you know, these solutions aren't apparent right now because of economics reasons, it doesn't mean that they can't exist. And so uh, by, by tracking the total cost of how much it takes to keep these things out of landfill, I think uh, that's another thing that I've been doing is, uh, you know, as much time as you spend trying to keep these things out of the garbage, that's really the total cost of those ice packs. And so it, I'm trying to broaden the discussion inside of client sites to the total cost of the product and not necessarily the total cost of the recycling program. So it, it's good to be able to think of these holistically as materials management and 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 not see them as sort of externalized, uh, trying to externalize the real cost of something that comes with the waste side. Yeah. Um, good. We'll we'll move on. Um, uh, we, uh, Amanda from the Penn State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center had submitted a question up front to um, uh, to point out that they have new scrub dispensing system that wraps each scrub item in a plastic bag. What are some recycling options to go with that? This is a good question. And my first question is, why are they wrapped in a plastic bag? And do they have to be? They might have to be, but I think a really high value first step is figuring out why. If someone says it's for infection prevention policy, go check the policy and ask why again. Um, I think that uh, connect with your neighbor institution and ask how their OR scrubs are delivered. My guess is that there's a chance you don't need the plastic bag at all. The second, and this is gonna, I'm gonna repeat myself, but super important, how many scrubs do you get delivered a year? Because those plastic bags add up. So I think you want to be able to tell the story in, in pounds of plastic a year, single use disposable plastics. And so I think really getting that total count of the amount of plastic that we're talking about. The third is that because we're talking about scrubs delivery, that's clean recyclables. It's really process highly likely that it will stay clean kind of on the cleanest side of things is when people are getting dressed to go into the OR, for instance. And so you, as long as you can keep that collection stream clean, you want to set up some quality guidance, quality audits, you can probably get it recycled. Plastic bags are recyclable. They're not highly recyclable. And so the best thing to do is see if we can avoid them altogether. But I think that, um, it is a good collection stream to educate your local vendors on the value um, and cleanliness of materials in the hospital. Sometimes, you know, the, the phrase hospital waste, it, it creates a certain connotation. 
And so there is always an opportunity to educate our local vendors um, on the level of quality and cleanliness that is inherent in the healthcare setting. It's, it's, it's an opportunity to use your position and your institution to help influence others and not just assume that, because that's the way it's provided. This, you know, hospital facility is much larger. You have some, some weight to be able to influence. Um, it's not automatically like a retail store where it just comes the way it is. Um, um, yes. Yeah, but, yeah. And I think if you can get the total count of those plastics, uh, is that creating extra cost? Again, if it's not necessary, it's not just the material. Somebody has to put those things in a bag. And so why why are we doing that? So really kind of digging into that and using the healthcare industry is great for these kinds of research projects. We very much have evidence-based decision makers. Re you know, it's a great research project. Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, I'll point out as we go along uh, for some of these these quick questions that have been written. Um, if if you happen to be on the line and you have a follow up or you want to engage, uh, again, feel free to un unmute yourself and just uh, ask your own follow up or or put something into the <clears throat> into that chat. But otherwise, we'll keep moving. Um, I, I did briefly want to go back to gel packs. I did um, there was a question from Michaela had put into the chat. Um, um, which is with the, the biodegradable gels, um, can those actually be dumped down a sink? Are they truly biodegradable in that sense? Um, can they be drained, used for composting or? It's a good question. And uh, there's a really slow, there's a slow answer. Uh, the, call the vendor. Uh, if somebody's putting something on their um, product, they should be able to explain what they mean by it. We get a lot of, asks right now, this is kind of not totally related, but similar, biodegradable plastics. And, you know, the answer is biodegrade into what? Um, and so, you know, you really do have to follow up with the vendors when they put these claims on their ice packs. The other person I would follow up with probably is your local, whoever is downstream, whoever's treating the water, you know, it does the, if you're in San Francisco, it does the Public Utility Commission have any thoughts on if they want to see you know, gel ice packs down the sink. And so I would cross-reference the regulatory guidelines in the area with the vendor claims and see what yeah. what's possible in, in your location. That makes sense. Yeah, um, you're reinforcing the point that biodegradable is not a regulated term and it gets used fast and loose by, um, in, in all different types of contexts with reusable or, or food packaging, et cetera. But, Great. Um, so let's keep moving on. Um, we had um, <clears throat> a question from uh, Vanya with Sustainable Works, and and her question was: um, there's a significant amount of gloves that's being used in her, and their medical facility. Um, is there a waste reduction recycling solution for gloves? There are a couple that I know of right now. So there's one that bears study in the United States, in the United States, which is appropriate use of gloves. Uh, there's a huge initiative in the among the national health system in the UK, which is uh, the gloves off campaign. And what they're looking at, very smart, they're cross-referencing their hand hygiene policy with common uses of gloves and recognizing when we're using gloves appropriately and, and when, when we maybe don't need them, that would just regular hand hygiene would be appropriate. Uh, one interesting note that I saw on that was from the, a children's hospital, which is that, you know, if you're a kid, you go in the hospital, actually gloves are a bit of a, um, not the most pleasant thing to come in contact with uh, all the time. And so this is, was actually a patient experience initiative as well as infection prevention. So there are some nice alignments there. So that's the first is, are you using gloves that maybe you don't need to, and people just put them on because they feel better in a situation. We also see in situations like that, where sometimes overuse of gloves is, uh, it doesn't ensure that you're in, uh, overuse of gloves doesn't ensure that you're improving infection prevention. Sometimes, uh, you know, hand hygiene is not correlated with that. So there is some infection prevention evidence there to reference. Okay, so that's number one is prevent if possible. The second is uh, recycle if it's feasible. Plastics are not always cheap to recycle, especially medical plastics. 
one recycling resource that uh, exists right now is the green, there's a green circle salons, so hair salons. And they have um, a PPE recycling program that is available. When you see these programs, again, these plastics are not super easy to recycle. And so take a look at how those plastics are being processed. Again, this is a zero waste solutions are relationship-based solutions. Talk to the folks that are running it. Make sure that what they're doing with plastics at the end of life cycle aligns with you know, your environmental goals and values. But uh, they have a pretty viable PPE recycling program available. The last one that I wanna note is I saw this really cool presentation a few years ago and I couldn't find a link to it, but if I ever do, if everyone, anyone comes across it, please send it to me. Uh, the country of Sweden uh, was looking at how to decarbonize some of their plastic products in the hospital. And one thing that they found, and I think everyone who's ever opened a glove box can attest to this, that you go to pull out, out one to two gloves and you get 15 in your hand. And again, that's an avoidable use of PPE. You don't get to put those back in the box. So there is this possibility that we are using 5% more gloves across the board than we really need to, something like that. And so uh, one solution that they had come up with was the manufacturer was stacking them facing each other. Some way that they packaged these uh, gloves actually reduced total waste. And so I think thinking about, you know, how can we partner with our vendors to help prevent avoidable waste is, is that's fun work to do. So you see the same dynamic with, with paper towels sometimes, some dispensers, you go for one and you end up with a handful of them. And yeah, that's that's a structural thing that, that generates unnecessary waste that in theory could be addressed. Yeah. Um, let me, uh, so let me come back to this question that was um, the Crystal from Johnson County Community College had posted. Um, they have various medical training programs, but would be, um, it would be a small generation of waste having a hard time finding suitable outlets. Um, yes, she listed a few different ones. And so yeah. here are a few notes that I have. Uh, is Crystal on the line by any chance? If not, then I'll just expand on her waste items. Uh, one thing that she was talking about is um, some packaging, um, there were also, I'm oh, sorry, let me take a look. There were some gauze products. And then, uh, I think also, at any rate, the first thing that I would say is, are there upstream solutions? Again, are there opportunities to avoid waste? One note that I don't, again, you have to really find the right end use for these products to make sure that you're appropriately sharing resources and not passing along waste items to someone else. But if there are learning labs inside of college campuses, that is one potential use for perfectly good supplies that come from a hospital, say, that are expired, but still packaged, still ready to go if it's a learning lab where you're learning not on other humans, right? And so if there's a, if you're learning how to, uh, I don't know, uh, give a shot to a, uh, I think, uh, you know, a sim lab type situation, uh, that's a really good use for use supplies. The other thing that I would say is if you're having, there was some like tubing, for instance, PVC, tubing, um, products like that. There is an organization that's studying the recyclability of these items. And a lot of these solutions are regional solutions. And so uh, the Healthcare Plastics Recycling Council is made up of a lot of folks that make these supplies. It's made up of a lot of um, hospital health systems that are trying to recycle them. And then also downstream processors. They really go across the entire value chain. And one thing that they have been working on for years is really connecting folks with recycling opportunities in their area. 
And so this is a good place to start is this vendor directory so that you can take a look at who is recycling these things or has been in your area. Again, this is a relationship business, so you want to reach out and really build your network. The, uh, the other thing that she talked about were lab plastics. There's a cool company that's doing a lot with lab plastics right now, and their name is Polycarbon. And they have a pretty good model where they're collecting just specific types of plastics and then uh, reprocessing, you know, recycling them, making new lab plastics. I believe is their model and they're great and they've been around for a while and I would definitely reach out to them as well. So I think those are a few options. And, and just point out again, I've, I've put the links to both of these um, just into the chat just in the last minute. So for polycarbon as well as the um, HPRC's recycling vendor directory. Um, and, and again, we'll have these also available afterward. Um, we have a couple more recyclability questions um, and just, again, put it out to everybody. If you have any questions on your end that um, of items, that, you know, recyclability is a question, feel free to drop those into the chat um, and I'll keep an eye out for those. Um, the, the next one I had uh, sent in advance was from Lisa with Sutter Health um, and that has to do with plastic syringe containers for CT injectors. And maybe first explain what is a CT injector for those who may not know off the top of their head. Yes, uh, there is, I'll tell you what it is in a product situation. There's a large syringe and it's attached to tubing. And for every case, this uh, large syringe um, is opened, used, and uh, contrast for your CT. If you're getting a CT to contrast, it goes through the syringe and it's the delivery mechanism uh, so that you can, things are more visible when you, when you scan them. So it's this pretty rigid single use disposable plastic. And I would characterize this. There's a few inquiries that we got and I'm gonna list them off. One is healthcare packaging. One is kind of these these niche, but very medical looking, single use disposable plastics. A third is e-waste, medical e-waste, because maybe there's a needle attached to it or something. So it's weird e-waste or gross e-waste, or not gross, but just, it's not it's not an iPhone. And so, uh, so these are hard to recycle materials. And so the first thing that you wanna do, again, this is where I'll repeat myself is, Get the scale. If you're at a health system, how many CT syringes do you use in your department? How many scans, you can do back of the napkin math during lunch hour. How many scans do you perform in a year? How many hospitals are there in your health system? And it adds up to a lot of plastics. And so uh, what you get from that is um, find a baby scale. We have one that was gifted by the kitchen uh, do a unit weight. And that's how many pounds of plastic this product is sending to landfill every year. There's not a fast solution with these products. Uh, the, the recyclability exists, but there's not, again, you could go to the HPRC uh, vendor lookup to see if there's folks that recycle items like this. Um, I think that what we just wanna show is the total cost or the total impacts of these products. Because sometimes you just need different products there if possible. And so that's that's number one. I think there was an, a, a related hard to recycle item, which was a continuous glucose monitor. This one I want to expand on because this is a new area that's growing in healthcare. And it's good news for healthcare. It's good news for our patients. Smart devices. There's a sensor inside of a device and it's attached to you. There may or may not be a needle attached. There may be tape attached. And so it's a, you know, you wear it and it lasts for a few days or a couple weeks. And, uh, and then when it, you're done using it, you throw it away. Or I, I looked up a couple of these online so that I was speaking correctly. Some of them do say it's e-waste, don't throw it away. And so I think that there's an opportunity for the vendors that are making these products to consider that 
at end of life, if you're using one of these every two weeks, like every patient is going to have 25 little pieces of e-waste in their house that they have to do something with. And is that really what we, is that what we want to do? Do we want to export the cost of disposing of these very cool, very important smart devices to a hospital? Um, and so I think there's an opportunity for the industry to put some standards in place. And the first way that you do that is really by showing the size of the problem. Uh, and again, that's by counting the total number, doing a little back of the napkin math, and then start to, to tell people about it. Yeah, um, and issues only get brought up and addressed with standards when folks on the ground are raising the, the, the problems, the complexities. And so that's, you know, in, in our position as sustainability managers, we're trying to change the way our institutions work, but it's also, we've become a conduit just to try to address broader issues um, that, that that we may not have direct control over in the moment in our individual facilities, but how can we help influence what's happening upstream um, on the manufacturing side? Yeah, and I think that this is where healthcare does have a bit of extra opportunity because these are patient safety issues, they're patient experience issues. And if you're a manufacturer of these products, it's the very last time your patients are going to interact with the product. And I think that they do such great work when they're working that we should really consider how we want the end of life or end of use experience to be and really kind of close that loop, if you will. So. Yeah, great. Um, I'll just give a shout out for a point that uh, Ken made in the chat, uh, putting out that they work with a nonprofit Peninsula Precious Plastics um, um, who accepts prop polypropylene um, needle caps uh, for various primary care, flu shots, et cetera. Um, they use this to make new new products, uh, but to, but if that's something of interest, you can find some links that can put into the chat on uh, learning more about what they do with that, that particular organization. Um, uh, we have another question from another colleague, I guess Rika at Sutter Health was asking about continuous glucose monitors uh, or staple for the program. Um, again, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of this is placed in the same thing, but do you wanna to talk to that? Yeah, I think this is the same thing. And if there's somebody on the line that knows more about these products, but the things that I looked up were, were one, it kind of instructs you to, to deposit it hazardously at end of life cycle. And so then, you know, it, it that's, I mean, it's hard, it's hard enough to, to get through the day doing all the things you have to do, let alone manage glucose, if that's something that you navigate as a patient, and then now you have this hazardous waste situation at the end. And so I think that we should really think about how we want to serve our patients. Uh, and I know that's not something that, um, that's, that's, a, that's up to our industry. There are models for this. If you look in Washington State, if you look in California, there are Sharpe's laws on uh, the books. There are medication uh, take back laws on the books. We don't have to wait for the laws. They're based on best practices, on usability, on really great EPR standards, and that's extended producer responsibility. And I think there's always an opportunity for uh, for healthcare to lead on these things. We don't. We don't have to wait for a policy. We can just do it ourselves. Yeah, all right, great. Uh, see, Timothy, you've got your hand raised. Do you want to um, speak up? Yeah. yeah, I just have, I I use a Dexcom glucose monitor so I can speak a little bit about it. Um, the, uh, the, the, there's a couple different parts to it, I guess you could say. There, there's a little transmitter electronic transmitter that lasts for about three months. And so at, at the end of three months, you have to change that out. Um, there is a probe that the transmitter connects to that uh, gets changed every uh, 10 days. So um, that's just a little plastic thing that the transmitter fits in that goes against your skin. Um, but with the with the ten day probe, there's a uh, insertion device, I guess you can call it, that uh, holds the little plastic holder, and then you have to push a button on the insertion device to insert it onto your skin. 
and the insertion device itself is kind of a big piece of plastic. There's some metal in it, but uh, it's basically just a big piece of plastic that uh, it's not hazard. There's no electronics on it or anything. Uh, I don't. I'm not too sure about recycling that. It's because it's mixed material. Um, the little plastic uh, probe thing that goes on your skin is just plastic um, with uh, two little. It's. I think it's got two little metal probes on it. And the transmitter is is the only thing that's really electronic. Um, yeah, I, I I have not really recycled any of the material because um, I don't. There's no real avenue to recycle it. The the probe and the transmitter would possibly be biological material that could would have to be handled a certain way. The the insertion device that I was talking about um, is not really biological material, but it is mixed. It's got metal and plastic inside of it. Um, so yeah, it's a it's just pretty not much um, ideas about how to recycle that material. Yeah, and my note is probably it's not that recyclable, and i I think it's okay. I think it's okay that not everything is totally. Recycle. I mean, it is, but some things are tricky, right? So they're lower on the list and higher in complexity. And that is acceptable. Again, the most important thing, right, is that it, do, it does its job and makes, makes lives better. Uh, how healthcare providers can support that is really asking the folks that supply these devices, especially if they're take-home devices for patients, how do you manage these things at end of life cycle? Are there things that are as sharp? Are there things that are have batteries inside or electronic parts? And if so, you know, what do, what should we instruct that? How do we make it easy for our patients to do right by these materials so that there's not confusion at home? I think it's part of, uh, sent, you know, providing these devices, just like, uh, again, medications is a great model. What you get now is instructions on how to responsibly dispose of those easily, so. Great. Um, in, in the chat, Rudy raised a question about blue wrap. What is the current state of recycling? I know that that's blue wrap is sort of one of the, the early areas where there's opportunities, but can you talk to sort of some of the trends um, around blue wrap? Yes, happy to. Blue wrap is for everyone who doesn't know, it is a single use disposable plastic. It's a sterile wrap. And the reason that it's very popular is because it's thick it is perforated, you can sterilize trays, that the steam goes in, the germs stay out. Uh, it's very uh, highly usable. It's a, it's a plastic fabric, it's 100% polypropylene, so your yogurt container uh, materials, but it's blown into a fabric, and so it conserves space, it's durable, it gets supplies to the OR clean and sterile. Uh, it's bulky because it's a, a fabric made of plastic. It takes a lot of space to get a lot of pounds of this blue wrap. And so while it is a uh, recyclable material, it's subject to things that hinder any recycling program. Uh, is there, it, does it take a lot of labor to make sure that it uh, moves through the building to a recycling area? It takes a lot of space in California, it's hard to find space on a hauler lot, for example, uh, where someone wants to let this stack up before it's a full kind of valuable load, similar to styrofoam, I would say. And so uh, it's challenging to recycle these sometimes. That being said, uh, a lot of the vendors, the first thing is uh, there are more vendors in the blue wrap market these days and there has always been blue wrap recycling available. And so one thing that I would recommend is that you, if you're buying blue wrap, you ask your vendor what their plan is to make sure that it, you're able to keep it out of landfill. I think that's the first thing. Uh, one thing I'm pretty passionate about these days and we'll have to chat about more is getting some sort of partnership into contract language about this. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for 
to formalize extended producer responsibility because realistically the blue wrap recycling programs were a good operational model for extended producer responsibility. And so what is the next logical step is really formalizing that. Uh, one thing that keeps blue wrap from being successful at scale that generators can do something about is quality. And so one thing that the blue wrap recycling program really provides as a value to hospitals, surgical centers, is clear standards for how you deliver this quality material at scale. And the best practice is that you collect it in sterile areas if possible, so that it's like your cleanest garbage in town. The second is that you fold it so that one, it's space efficient, again, because this stuff can take up a lot of space if you wad it up instead of fold it. But it's also a shorthand that somebody's eyes have been on it so that it can move through the hospital really quickly and you know that you're not, it's been quality checked. And so if hospitals can get it to their back dock, knowing that someone's eyes have been on it, that it's folded, that you know you have those quality systems in place, then it's a lot easier to recycle your blue wrap downstream. And I think if hospitals could focus on that, those quality rules, I think you'd have a little bit more leverage, again, to go to your blue wrap vendors and ask for assurances, ask for transparency and real partnership, a long-term partnership in uh, making sure that these things are recycled. Uh, there are um, there are vendors. I know that Iron Mountain was recycling blue wrap. Again, it really depends on your institution and who you're buying from. Uh, but uh, would happy to be to connect you with some blue wrap recycling resources. Yeah, it, it seems like in a lot of cases, again, given the size of a hospital and, and the value being generated, there 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 are opportunities that exist outside of just the normal MSW collection streams. I, I know the, the local medical university here in, uh, where I'm in, in Charleston um, developed a relationship with our local, the Sunoco, uh, and they were they were even doing like sandwich bales. They would they would put they would um, aggregate what they were collecting, but then because they didn't have enough of a quality or enough quantity to make it worth sending, you know, whole bales to them on a regular basis, they would do special arrangement. But this was all through sort of developing, uh, putting a putting in place a system working directly with the vendor, the service provider that um, they weren't necessarily advertising. Um, yes, and uh, one way to find good downstream processors for your healthcare materials is again, to build that relationship, people wanna know where your healthcare waste came from. And so if you can tell them that you've got this material, that's why Blue Wrap is kind of a great project to do inside of hospitals. It's generated in sterile areas by people that are basically scrubbed for a case before a patient even rolls in the room. Again, if you can have that quality check assurance that you're sending out 100% quality stuff, it's a pretty good sales job to a plastics processor. It's one material. It's not like they're going to get some other things mixed in there with it. And so it's a great relationship builder. Uh, to build that joint assurance and, and quality relationship. And so uh, that's really what haulers or plastics processors want to know is, is it safe to take your stuff? And so if you can explain to them where your plastics, any plastics has been, how you keep it clean, what your quality processes are, then you do have a little bit more uh, room to recycle more of these plastics. Quality problems not only compromise safety, at the hauler site, which is really important. If they're having to put extra eyes on it, it makes your value, your plastics less valuable. Uh, and so really what we want to do is work with our haulers to build that quality internally so that we have more latitude to recycle these things outside of the hospital. Yeah. And that's actually a good segue um, to, to sort of move beyond some of these direct recyclability questions, but just about procedures um, and how do we, how do we, because this is a, there's um you know the keeping things safe is is a is a priority um i know bill from reduction of motion put in a question she, he alluded to um a situation with um not having good protocols that actually led to um more severe 
consequences. But can you speak a little bit more to sort of the compliance side and how can how can you put in place these kinds of programs while not stepping on that third rail of you know potentially putting life in at a risk? Yeah, I think this is a nice thing to build on. Again, really what you want, if you're trying to get recyclables out of a clinical area, you really want to know that these things are clean and dry. And before we get into the risky part of healthcare waste, one thing that I've, one of the biggest risks to say clinical plastics, these items come out of pretty clean areas. You don't do a procedure and then like the patient is covered with packaging. It's already in a clean zone. And so really the opportunity is to go in and work with clinicians, work with the collection and service team to understand what's their workflow that exists in that clinical area. And so where within that workflow can you capture these items to keep them clean, to prevent them from any kind of contamination in room? One of the biggest risks to quality in clinical plastics is collecting it alongside like all the other recyclables because you know, if somebody pours coffee on it, it's that's it's contaminated re regardless of um, you know where it came from. And so I just want to put that out there, which is like, I think the most sustainable clinical plastic recycling models collects that as a very special stream by itself. I don't think it goes with our municipal waste, in my opinion. Uh, I think for a, again for a sustainable program that you can build on for five plus years. Uh, so talking about how this aligns with medical compliance, I think is important. Uh, the, the way to uh, capture clinical recyclables in a quality manner, you have to combine healthcare quality and safety principles, number one. If you work outside of the quality and safety standards for the healthcare setting, not only is your program risky, it's not built to last. And so it, it takes longer to stand up a program within these models, a lot of people get frustrated. And so I would say, hang in there, let's do this good work together for a long time. Uh, and then you, the fun part is when you take those healthcare quality and safety standards and you combine them with, there's a lot of really great zero waste science out there. Uh, how do you set up bins so that it's easy for somebody moving quickly to properly sort something? You know, wh where does your signage go? How do you structure education? Uh, what does your quality audit system look like? And so those things that make a, a very busy three-stream recycling program successful can actually help reinforce, you know, or operationalize those healthcare quality and safety standards. Um, regulated medical waste is in the news these days. You know, these sorting problems happen. Uh, they could happen to any institution. And that is why Healthcare waste, again, has a certain connotation. Uh, one thing that happens in these situations, you really do have to balance with any waste management project in a clinical area. Uh, what's the sorting burden like on our clinicians? If you walk into an OR right now, you might see nine collection bins. And anytime that there's a new zero waste initiative, someone says, great, we'll put a bin in there. And it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> because, you know, you, you don't want to trip over something in the, in the middle of a case. And it's just too much, right? There's like too much... Um, burden that that doesn't have to do, frankly, with delivering care. And so you really do have to balance that sorting burden. But sometimes what happens is if you look at just the burden of compliance, which is, again, paramount, you look at minimizing the sorting burden on clinicians, there is a temptation to overclassify waste. So you can't recycle anything from this area. We want to treat everything as metal, you know, biohazardous in this room. We want to treat everything as hazardous waste. And you know, if you if you follow that logic loop to the nth degree, you kind of tuck yourself back into an incinerator. And those got eliminated for a reason. And so I I think that that's really important. You it, I think that it behooves us to also consider the environmental impact of these decisions. How much extra packaging waste are you generating by classifying something as hazardous waste? How much? How many pounds of plastic are you just using once and then literally trucking to an incinerator? Uh, and so is, is that the right decision? I think it's right from one, healthcare is in the climate action business. And so we need to act like that in, in all of our operations. And so it, again, if you're 
if you're not taking the environmental considerations into place now, you will be. And what that means practically is that it's a lot of work to plan these programs. It's a high stakes environment. And so you really wanna make the most out of your focus in these areas. If you're not taking environmental considerations into place, I think you you might be replanning your programs before you, you really want to. Uh, the other thing that happens as well is that the hospital is like a little city. And so it's really, you wanna be able to set up a program that, that everyone is bought in on. Um, what happens when we tend to overclassify is maybe somebody in a certain department wants to reduce their medical waste generation. Again, now your, your program starts to get a little fragmented. And so, um, so I think that the answer is, you know, really investing in how we generate waste. There's just a lot of smart work to be done. And so I hope that we will continue to balance the consider the consideration that we, we can and should be total, reducing total waste uh, while, again, supporting that compliance. That was a long answer, but I think I covered all the good points. <laughs> That's good. I mean, you're you're getting into some of the the nitty gritty of the, the friction points, the barriers that 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 explain why it is so hard to make progress on on waste and and healthcare. But uh, but but the point you're making about just the risk and the creating sort of this uh, if not knee jerk, uh, definitely leaning into the thought of we don't even want to leave a margin for for you know possible risk, and so therefore we're going to just make a hard line that that can be arbitrary on on some levels, and um, and if there are alternative, you, need to, you can't just uh, you shouldn't just accept that without uh, having to justify that a little bit more. There, there's no easy answer, and it, it really is this balance. How do we balance? How do we make materials management important enough that people do it correctly? How do we what's the most valuable thing to focus on so we don't burn out our frontline staff on, again, I think there's like 40, 40 plus collection streams in a hospital. How do we make that easy? So I, I think there's really good work to be done here from process innovations. People always kind of look at what are we doing with these things at, at the, the end of life? Again, how do we make it as easy as possible? I think there's probably some, um, you know, if, if you look upstream at our, how supplies get to us, there's just a lot of logistics process innovations there. I think that's where that kind of looking at what happens at end of life, like treating that as part of the product life cycle. I think there's a lot of opportunity to help make it easy to properly sort things into their right stream in the clinical environment. So would love to, tons of research to be done there. We have just a few more minutes um, to go. Um, I, I do have a couple more questions to pass out. And, uh, and again, if, if anyone online has uh, any questions they want, here's your sort of last call to put those into the chat. Um, from uh, This is a, an advanced question uh, from Diane with Norwalk Zero Waste Coalition had asked, um, do you have data such as cost savings that compares traditional healthcare waste management with a more sustainable method? And so and this is kind of a macro question. But, um, so yes. That. yes. So your municipal waste streams, first of all, this is pretty variable uh, and it just depends on, quite frankly, regionally, how expensive is it for you to send things to a garbage? And so some places there's policy where there's not that much room in the landfill anymore. And they, uh, so it's more expensive. If you're in a region where there's not a compost program set up and somebody has to truck out a lot of extra miles, for those municipal waste streams, you're not always gonna get a dollar for dollar savings. However, when you move upstream, that is where there are savings to be had. Donating meals instead of throwing them in the garbage is basically within reason, you know, free or lower cost. Uh, and so how do you, how can you redistribute that food within your community so that you're supporting community health as well as, as donating those items? 
again, donating your medical supplies. Uh, you want to partner with a vendor that has good standards. Uh, donating those things, that's taking things out of your garbage for free. And so that's cost neutral. When you're looking at reusables, we just had this great webinar that I'll refer you to on reprocessing, reusables. You start to save real money because what you're doing is taking an investment in a product and you're dividing that by the number of uses in its life cycle. I think UCLA, I think their savings were about $1.4 million on reusable isolation gowns. And again, you really wanna look at the comparative total number of uses. You're taking tons of waste out of landfill and you're saving money. So that's a high value program. Looking at items that are come out of a room unused after a procedure, after a patient checks out, there's a lot of hidden waste there. And that's a great opportunity for clinical process improvement to prevent that waste. Uh, you know, by making sure that it, it, it doesn't come into a place where infection prevention deems it, contam you know, not eligible for reuse in the hospital. Um, again, reprocessing, you, uh, you save money if you don't send those items to the sharps bin or the landfill. And so reprocessing collection saves you money. And likewise, if your institution buys back, either non-invasive or invasive, uh, supplies reprocess, you save a lot of money. And so that is where healthcare waste prevention really saves you money is that loss prevention, waste prevention, reprocessing, reusables, and then donations, I think. So just a one one quick question. I mean this could be its own deep dive, but but um in terms of of sort of a decision tree or prioritizing if, if you're starting from a point of setting up your broad strategy, where do you want to focus your efforts first? Is Are there case studies or the resources that have been published that just, you know, it's going to be different a little bit for each institution, but just sort of a broad list of where your bang for your buck is with the different approaches. Is, is there a, one direction folks can go to find guidance like yes. that? Yes. Practice Green Health, if you look up Practice Green Health and then you can look up their waste prevention page, I bet that they have a lot of resources. They also did work um, I don't know if they're available online. There's some healthier hospital initiative um, links, but Practice Green Health should have some uh, public facing case studies, I think is a good place. You could start in two places. You really do want to start small. You really want to start the world's smallest pilot. I mean, one item on one unit for six weeks. And so to start small, generally what comes from the grassroots interest, somebody wants to start a recycling program. It's not the thing that's going to save you $700,000, a million dollars in a year, but it does help you get the mechanics in place. You do have to set up a collection. You have to set up the quality apparatus. You have to set up your systems so that you can keep that item clean. And so those programs are great. Any recycling program is valuable in your hospital because it helps, it engages people and helps you set up your quality management apparatus. And so once you have that in place, then you can go after these projects projects that pay dividends. If you can keep a, if you can keep a soda bottle clean <laughs> to the dock, you're in great shape to successfully take products out of rooms again using engagement and quality management to make sure that the that you feel good about donating them. You're in you're in shape to put reusable gowns into the mix and not worry about them uh, getting lost in the system. So, I think uh, you can start small and know it's an investment and it is an investment but it does pay off when you start looking at those big items yeah great um we have we have a, a last question here uh, that leah put into the chat um and this is the big one so uh, it, 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 it tell me if there's sort of you have a, a, a quick answer to go with this but um but just it, this is about culture how do you get people to engage who might have just sort of that toss in. You know, this is a pretty universal to lots of settings, but um, and any any high level words of wisdom topper there? Yes, you want to do a couple things. One is systems. Uh, I think about this in uh, cafeterias. I think that uh, it's a bit tragedy of the commons. Everyone's moving quickly. And so maybe we should reconsider how we're collecting things in these busy areas. Uh, I, again, in California, there's a lot of laws that say you have to have three stream recycling in uh, 
lobbies, again, maybe the what we're trying to do is figure out where we can aim quality sorting and things like this to, to really get those streams clean. Uh, in where you do have an opportunity is you do have this quality apparatus inside of the hospital. And so one thing that you can do uh, is, uh, I'm gonna shout out UCSF who's on the call. You, you don't get a recycling bin unless you've your unit, a certain number of people have taken training. And so make sure that you're not setting up a program until people have signed on for education because it's proof of engagement. The other thing that I'm doing with a client is setting up a complete recycling program. You don't get a bin, you get a program because that is the truth of the matter. And so if you have a bin, you get to audit that bin. And so we can, you know, there's the hospital systems have audit platforms in place. There's also some, um, I know Zabble is a tool that does zero waste audits. And so if you get a pro program, uh, you have to do a certain number of audits on your unit to keep that program. And what that does is it helps the people that are recycling, that are uh, participating in that program, to get the feedback themselves. That's what you want. You want to keep the feedback in the system where the generator is. And I think that's how you really extend that culture of care that's already in healthcare to these materials. Yeah. And, and, and those are all great points. Um, I, I would just reinforce behavior in general requires engagement. Um, there's for a long time, there's kind of this, this belief that you just need to stick out bins, you know, it just in, in a basic recycling context and people will use them because people can read and people care. And, um, but we, we know from decades of trying to do behavior change it, in its simplest form, people need to be engaged and, and reinforce that activity, given those feedback loops. Those are all sort of basic aspects of, of uh, how we, we change culture over time. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Thank so, you. So th you know, there is no way, but when we recognize that and are creating this highest best use, the term that I use a lot is you're getting into a long-term relationship with your stuff, with the people that are, you know, you're linked in that process. And so again, that's transparency, it's quality and it's uh, relationships. And so that's the key to success. Yeah, good. We are at the end. I want to, um, before we part, I just want to give a couple quick shout outs. Um, uh, one, um, it, as I alluded to the beginning, and you mentioned earlier, um, we did a program last month for those of you who didn't make it, um, but we do have a recording and the slides and resources from both this program we did last month, as well as one we did on uh, also on healthcare waste back in 2021. Um, so there's good, great resources. If you want to see actual um, recorded presentations, you can find those on our website um, at the link here, bushsystems.com com blog backslash blog backslash webinars where we can hit that QR code. Um, we will, as I mentioned, also have a recording today as well as um, the resources that Erica shared will also be posting in the next day or two and we'll 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 send out a link to everybody registered once that's available. Um, just want to give a shout out our we're um, we're still putting together the pieces, but uh, the theme for next month's program is is stepping back and looking at recycling in general. Um, many of us have been hearing over the recent years uh, across the country and even internationally that there's, there's this growing skepticism around does recycling really work? Does it do what it, it means to, uh, to um, th does it actually achieve the ends that it, it's intended to? So we're going to be focusing on how do you actually build confidence? How do we um, address that skepticism? It will be the theme of next month. We don't have a date set yet, but, um, but do keep an eye out for details to come. Um, and I also want to just give a quick shout out to my colleague, Michelle Dunn. Um, you know, we're, we're not focused on, on Bush Systems products and all with this program, um, but, but I do want to just give a shout out, obviously, that, that we, um, as a company, we do provide quality recycling and waste bins. Uh, Michelle Dunn is our sales rep and our, our manager for the healthcare sector. So if you ever have any questions, um, interest, I encourage you to reach out to Michelle um, through her contact information here or, or just through our, our website also. Um, so we're at the very end, um, uh, when this program shuts off, um, in a couple seconds, um, you should see a little pop-up on your screen, uh, to fill out a survey. If you wouldn't mind taking 20 seconds to, uh, just answer a couple questions that give us feedback on how we can, um, improve these programs. And especially with this format where we're, we're experimenting with more of an interactive, uh, discussion, would love to get your thoughts on how we can make these more constructive. Um, Erica, thank you again. Really appreciate your help with last month's presentation and again today. Um, thank you very much.
Thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks again for everyone to spend, for spending the time with us. Great. Everybody have a good day and we'll talk to you again soon. Sounds good.